computer. Okay. Um, another point is, can everybody see the subtitles that's at the foot of the page? Yeah. 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 Sometimes you need to turn that on. Um, just depends on your setup. That's really all it is, which is fine. As I say, this is my first time doing a thing like this, so we just need to see how it goes. Um, it'll be fine. A wee bit of background of myself, um, very, very briefly, is that I lead the church in a wee place called Port Gordon, which is in the Murray Firth, um, northeast, um, along with my wife, Sharon. And we've probably been doing that <coughs> Last eight years, Sharon. Yeah, about eight years. Um, it was a church plant, plant, very much a pioneering kind of ministry, but certainly a, a church plant. Um, and my background is pretty varied. Um, I was brought up in the Brethren Church, um, and then I got I moved up to Bucky as I say, about 26 years ago, and started going along to the Methodist Church. Um, and there I became a lay pastor in the Methodist Church. And then, as I say, about eight years ago or so, we set up the Percordon Community Church, which has been great. But I, whilst I was in the Methodist Church, I had to continue my studies. Um, to be a lay pastor, you need to go through a, um, what they call a lay preacher's course. Um, that takes about five years, I think. And then I had, was advised to continue my studies, which I did. Um, and this is one of the subjects that I looked at, um, was how to share the gospel with those who, I called it those, um, special people, um, but special people as folk with learning difficulties or disabilities. <clears throat> um, and we'll speak a wee bit more probably about that as time goes on. I may add as well, if you've got any questions at all, don't be frightened to ask. Um, I will try and answer them. If I can't answer them, then Sharon will an an answer them. Um, but I will certainly, if I can't answer them, I'll get an answer for you and get back to you. And um, there's no question about that. So feel free to ask any questions at any time. Um, just give us a shout or put your hand up or holler or whatever it might be, just to get my attention. Um, but we're going to look at it for three different points tonight. The first one being, um, what is the gospel? And then we'll look at kind of doing practical gospel, um, if you want to use a, a, a heading. And then finally, I would like just to briefly look at um, something what I've called, what about your church? Um, so that's the three different angles that we're going to take tonight. Um, so I will be asking questions, so feel free to give me your answers, um, because it's very much, hopefully it'll be very much interactive, uh, and I'm cool with that, as I, as I say. But I think, first of all, we really need to understand what the gospel actually is. A few probably last month, I think it was, um, I was on a Zoom meeting with a lad from Aberdeen University, um, Professor Tom Gregg, and he had written a, a book which is called The Bread of Salvation. Um, absolutely, it was a brilliant night, it was a great talk. And again, it kind of made me re 
look at salvation, re-look at the gospel, and kind of come at it again. I think so often we can get caught in one train of thought. So often we can get caught in one pattern, if you like. Um, so that made me revisit what the gospel is, what salvation is. Um, and I hope I don't get sidetracked. But even if we take, take it for a creation point of view, um, it does say in Hebrews that the whole of creation groans with what's like child, uh, birth pains. Now, that, that's interesting because, of course, the whole of creation is humanity, it's um, the animal kingdom, it's vegetation. Um, and again, if you fast forward to Revelation, um, Revelation 20 or Revelation 22, it says there will be a new heaven and a new earth. So often we focus on the new heaven, but we kind of forget about the new earth part. Um, so that's, that's interesting, but that's me getting sidetracked. Um, so can anybody tell me what the gospel is or what's your idea of the gospel? Feel free to speak. And there was silence. Good news. Right. Is it a bit literal? Good news, yeah. Simple, yeah. If you look at the if you look at the Greek meaning of the gospel, then basically that's what it means. It means good news. Um, good news in terms of Christ's death. Good news in terms of his resurrection as well. Um, and good news that he died for our sins. Um, and one day, if we believe, if we trust, if we have faith in him, then we will be with him in heaven. Um, but that, I don't think that's just what it means. And that's what I'm saying. Sometimes we get caught in a one-track mind. Um, so we do. And sometimes it's good to try and widen that um, a wee bit. And hopefully tonight we might be able to widen our viewpoint on that. We can't uh, really can't ignore the fact. Um, and for me, um, first and foremost, it is about telling people that Jesus died for them and that they need their sins forgiven, etc., etc. That's first and foremost. But I remember being at church, um, our own church in Port Gordon, and we, we are really blessed by having a good number of guys with special needs that come along. Um, it really is an amazing thing. But I will remember I was preaching on um, a sermon that you need to ask or you need to invite Jesus into your heart. Now, I'm sure many of us has heard that phrase that you need to invite Jesus into your heart. Or if you've no heard that you've maybe even preached on it. Um, after the Sunday during the week, I got a phone call from one of the lad's mums who was there who has got learning difficulties. And she had said that they had an amazing conversation um, with her son um, in regards to asking Jesus into your heart because often people with learning difficulties take literal meanings. So I said, you ask Jesus into your heart. Jesus is a person. How can he come into your heart? 
Now, again, is a lot about the language that we use. I never thought twice about using that language because that's what we say. Um, so it was quite difficult, if I'll be honest, it was quite difficult having to go and speak to a lad um, about Jesus being in your heart. Um, and I mean, how can Jesus physically come into your heart? It is an impossible thing to happen. We know what it means, but somebody with learning difficulties would have, would have great difficulty in understanding that. Um, and as I said, we may know and understand what the good news looks like for us, um, but we're not speaking about us tonight um, because we're speaking about what does it actually mean? What does good news mean for somebody with learning difficulties? Um, and really the first point is, and this can be a wee bit controversial, um, there's different, many different viewpoints on this, um, so, so there is a lot of different theological ideas on this as well. Um, but we need to look at the age of understanding. Um, some people would say that doesn't exist. Um, others would say that there is an actual age of understanding. Um, and of course, when we're speaking about the age of understanding, what we're saying is how they understand the gospel. Um, it does say in Matthew chapter 19, I'm sure we're aware of that, um, but Jesus said, let the little children come unto me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs uh, to these to such as these. So as a child who may not understand, uh, the kingdom of heaven is belonging to them. Um, I became a Christian at the age of seven. I could understand in a simple way, but I could understand that Jesus died for me, um, that I had sinned. And I needed to repent of my sins at that young age. So I invited Christ into my life in a simple way um, at that age of seven. But of course, that doesn't just, as when we're speaking about kids with learning difficulties, age is a total different thing because you might get somebody who's 12, um, 13, 14. They may or they may not understand the gospel as we understand it. Um, you may get somebody who is in their 30s, 40s, and they don't understand um, that they have sinned against God. Um, so we need to ask the question, and it's a very, very, it can be a very difficult question. Do they need to accept Jesus into their life? Um, whatever age at that, whatever age they are, whether it's, I say, whether it's 8, 9, 10, um, 21, 31, 41. Um, I think personally that the clue is in the title there because it's the age of understanding. So as, and it's understanding that you're doing wrong. It's understanding that you've sinned. It's understanding that you need a saviour, etc. Um, so really a lot of guys were learning therefore he wouldn't have a concept about that so again we come back to that same question what is the good news for them um, and that's really what we're looking at tonight um, any questions so far or any thoughts so far Very, very quiet. 
Um, so I'll tell you a story and it really is, it's an amazing story. When I was in the Methodist church, there was a lad there um, who had learning difficulties. Um, I knew him pretty well and he announced to his mother that he would like to join the church. So he would. Um, I don't know what the Anglican church, I don't know how their system is set up for somebody joining the church or Loving Waters or Elam. Um, but certainly my experience of joining the church, um, joining the Methodist church I'm speaking about, was quite intense. You had to go through X amount of classes. Um, you had to meet with the minister on different occasions. And it was quite intense. So I thought to myself, how on earth is a lad with learning difficulties going to manage to go through this? It's impossible, absolutely impossible. So what I did was I broke it right down to the simplest format. Um, and really, it was just asking, do you love Jesus? I mean, that was basically the kind of thing that we're looking at. Um, and he could acknowledge that he did. So we cut a long story short. Um, we agreed that he was going to join the church. And there's usually a service for that. But again, um, this was problematic um, because you had other folk there who were struggling um, with uh, different issues. So I thought, how can I make it understandable or make it make sense of it for everybody that was there? So what I did was I put it up in a PowerPoint, um, slides up in a power PowerPoint as we were going through the service. And again, to cut a long story short, we came to the part where he had to come up to the front um, and make some promises. Now, his mum had said, there's no way, Willie, you'll ever get him up front. No way on this earth, you can forget it. Um, I said, that's okay, I can come down beside him, etc., etc." So when I announced um, that he, would, he could come up front, he turned to his mum and said to his mum, you stay there, I'm going up beside Willie. And he came up and we went through the service. And that was an amazing time. He was able to understand that. But as I say, what does it actually mean for somebody um, who has got learning difficulties? What does the gospel mean? What does the good news mean for them? And we'll come on to that in a minute. But there are other things that we can look at. I know I spend too much time on this, but what happens if somebody's profoundly deaf and they go to church? And that is actually one reason why I've put the subtitles up tonight. Um, because, as I say, we'll speak about that a wee bit about this later. Um, but there is a group that's attached to our church called Fruit Footprints, and it's guys with learning difficulties. Um, it's more or less a social group for them. It meets on a Thursday. Um, but of course, with COVID restrictions, we couldn't meet. Um, so we'll come on to that a wee bit later. But what happens if somebody comes to church and is really profoundly deaf. How do they understand what's going on? Add to that music. Now we would say when unfortunately some people when you mention worship and um, they just think of music actually worships an awful lot more than that. But if we just take the music side of worship um, then how does somebody who can hear understand the music? 
how can they listen to the music? Um, and of course, music probably for most of us um, is a massive thing in worship. You cut that out for somebody who's deaf and you're cutting out a whole section, a whole part of that worship for them. The only reason that I know this, and I'll tell you another story, the only reason I know this is that one of the primary schools, um, I was doing a, an assembly and I had the opportunity to get a Christian worship group, a rock group up um, to the school. Well, they were in the area for quite a while, but I had them in at the schools. Um, and I knew there was a lad there who was really profoundly deaf. And I remember turning to the headmistress and saying, that's a real shame because that lad can't hear this music. And she said, but he can. Now that really threw me big time. Because I'm thinking to myself, well, he's profoundly deaf. How on earth is he going to hear what's happening? but he could hear it through the vibration on the floor. So again, that is another way that people would uh, enter into to worship. But it's a massive problem, and we'll come on to this later on. It's a massive problem if somebody's deaf. How can they hear what's happening? And then some of you might, um, be kind of taken aback at the next point. Um, but what about iconography? Um, iconography is a massive, massive thing in church that I believe has been lost. If you take a Catholic church, um, the Catholic church use a lot of symbols if you go in and visit a Catholic church, there is a lot of paintings or pictures on the walls. So there is um, a lot of emblems, et cetera, et cetera. And you have got to ask the question, why are they there? Why do they have stained glass, even in some Church of Scotland buildings you, and Anglican churches as well? you would have a lot of stained glass windows. Um, you may well have a lot of paintings as well. Why? Why are they there? Well, if you think about it, years ago, especially in Christ's time, um, people couldn't read or write. And actually, we just started being really educated in that sense, not that long ago. Um, so how could people understand if you can't read the Bible and you've not got anybody there to read the Bible for you, how can you know what God's going to say? So a lot of these pictures, a lot of stained glass windows tell a story. So somebody who can't read or write could look at a picture and get a lot from a picture. One of my friends who's in the Catholic Church, um, a really good friend who's in the Catholic Church, um, I remember saying to him, um, having a bit of discussion with him and saying, look, what's the crack with all the bells and smells and whatnot? Um, he says, all right. He says, you're going to tell me that's a load of rubbish, aren't you? I says, well, I wouldn't be so blunt, but What's behind it? I mean, what's the, what's the news about that? And he really enlightened me to it. And this is just for his perspective. I'm not saying this is across the board, but this is from his perspective. Um, what he said was, if you're teaching kids, nine times out of 10, if you're teaching kids, what you'll use is object lessons. So you will. Um, whether it's pictures, whether it's illustrations, whatever it might be, but you'll use objects to explain that lesson. And I says, I, of course I do. He says, well, that's what I'm doing with the bells, etc." It He says, I am explaining what I'm saying 
through that. It says, if you like, I am showing Jesus through these things. Um, and even through the pictures, through the paintings, he's explaining the Bible stories to them through these. Keep in mind, a few centuries ago, people couldn't read or write. Just, it wasn't happening. Um, we are so privileged nowadays that we can. We've got good education. Um, but in the days, then they had none of that luxury. I love, I don't know if everybody has heard of this place, um, but I love to go to Pliscarden Abbey. Um, it's one of the, um, one of the remaining abbeys, certainly in this area. It's occupied, it's a working abbey. Um, you can actually go there for a period of time if you want. Um, there are monks there as well. Um, and I sometimes go up and visit it. One of the times I was up, um, one of the services, I can't remember the, the type of service it was, but one of the monks came in with, um, like, just a, a brass cup that had smoke in it. It was it was um, smouldering. Obviously, there was some um, embers in that, and it was smouldering. So he was just shaking the smoke back and forward. Um, a beautiful scent actually coming off it. But what intrigued me was it wasn't that long before that smoke filled the whole room. And if we think about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit can come in and fill the whole room, it was a beautiful picture of that. So it was. And again, someday we're learning difficulties, we'd be able to understand that. If I had to try and sit them down and explain the Trinity or explain the Holy Spirit to them, they wouldn't have a clue what was on about. But if I take something like that and they see it visibly, then they can actually understand that. So they can. Um, Is it the rhythm of the flute? I wouldn't be sitting with the flute tonight. I think I should change. Okay, I thought somebody was speaking there, but that's not. Um, so, time is marching on. Um, and we come to the practical gospel, as it were. How do we share the gospel with those with learning difficulties then? Um, actually, another thing, sorry, I'm backtracking here, but another thing about the gospel, if we take the basic element of the gospel, it's not just good news, but it's love. Um, I love my neighbor. I love my friends. If they're no Christians, then I want them to become Christians because I don't want to see them being lost in a, uh, uh, an eternal uh, torment. Neither I do. The reason I do that is because I love them, I care for them. So really not only is it good news, but the basic principle of the gospel is love as well. And we just need to look at uh, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, John 3 and 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Um, you notice that word there, it says, for God so loved the world. It doesn't say God loved the intellect, God loved the academics, God loved those who could understand. It says God loved the world. And the whole of the world actually includes creation, but we'll not go into that or we we'll really will. Um, go and do a whole different subject. Um, so we do. But we need to love our neighbor as 
ourself. And that is one of the biggest commandments there is. Um, one of the biggest things, or one of the biggest ways that I find, I'm speaking personally here, but one of the biggest ways I find to share the gospel, share the good news, share the love of God with somebody who has got learning difficulties is simply to mentor them. I don't need to, we've kind of established that they wouldn't understand the doctrinal or theological issues behind the Bible. Um, they wouldn't understand things like that. But what they will understand is love. What they will understand is me caring for that person. Um, and that is a massive, massive thing. Um, and that can either be spiritual mentoring, that can be physical mentoring, um, whatever that might be. If we look at the life of Christ, um, it's a it's a brilliant, absolutely brilliant um, example of how he shared the gospel with those around about him, i.e. 12 people. Um, he walked with them daily. He fed them. He did speak to them, but he showed them miracles and other things like that as well. He just didn't take them to church or a temple, as it were, and sit down and say, right, guys, I am going to give you a four-hour lecture on predestination or um, whatever it might be. No, they followed him day by day. He mentored them day by day. And they had their ups and downs, so they did along that way. And I think we can even take that example from Christ, Christ's life, that we need to mentor people. We need to either spiritually um, help them or physically help them as well. Um, and again, if we look at the way he did it, um, there's a great thing in the Gospels, especially, called the parables. Um, can anybody explain what a parable is? <laughs> you might need to unmute. What is a parable? Mm -hmm. <laughs> is it meant to be a uh, easier way of understanding but it's not <laughs> okay right like, uh, a example, yeah. like a example yeah yeah like a like a nursery rhyme <laughs> <laughs> like a nursery rhyme don't tell us tell us just two parables I don't tell the hail story but just tell us name two name two parables oh my goodness would would like the one about the treasure be one right okay how he gives you a treasure and one one multiplied it the other one would that be a parable yeah yeah um if it's another parable he's been blunk <laughs> um oh the one about the the tree right or yeah. it's like um does it say something about um the the leaves or something is that a parable for yeah, the there fruit? No fruit there's no fruit on the tree it's withered is that a parable yeah yeah but what did what did jesus do there like examples right he used everyday examples he used a tree mm -hmm. he used a treasure chest he used a bush he used mm -hmm. fish he used those, he used people, prodigal mm -hmm. son, he used people. Mm -hmm. He told, um, he told stories about what heaven was like, so he did. And he used everyday things that people could relate to, to explain 
what the kingdom of heaven is like. Do we do that? Just a question. No, we <laughs> complicate it. <laughs> people, that, still, people still speak to me and I'm like, what? What are you going on about? <laughs> like Christian lingo. It is complicated for Christians. Yeah. Now I go back to the point that was first started. How do we share the gospel with somebody that we're learning difficulties? Christians can't understand it. What chance have these guys got? So again, we need to we need to think about that. He used branches, he used a gate, he used a door, um, he used a vine, um, and so the list could actually go on. And actually, if you think, I think you had somebody in, somebody speaking on communion, is that right? Again, mm -hmm. even in communion, what did he do? He used bread as a symbol of his body. He used wine as a symbol of his blood. So again, he's using symbols even in a deep thing, if you like, like um, like communion, he's still using symbols. Um, again, if you get somebody with learning difficulties, you use you use symbols like that. They understand, so they will. Um, I think again, it's interesting because if we go back a wee bit, backtrack a wee bit. Um, Jesus only taught 12, so he did. Um, there's maybe, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, 100 in some churches. And one guy is supposed to teach all these. So they're virtually impossible. Virtually impossible to spiritual mentor all these folk especially when Jesus only did 12. And again, that's another thing that we need to look at. I think it's very much one-to-one -one with somebody with learning difficulties, so it is. Um, but if my time is taken up with that one person, what about the rest? And I think that's the importance of um, mentoring guys with learning difficulties. Um, so it does. The, one of my favorite authors is a pastor, actually, and an author. Um, is an American lad, Francis Chan. Um, I highly recommend him. But I remember listening to him, and he was speaking about the social care system in America um, that would look after kids. And he had said that if every church, I can't remember if it was Texas or in America, but if every church took one kid from a social care system, then there would be no need for a social care system to look after, the, after kids. That is one church. That is not one person in each church. That is just one church. And that is absolutely phenomenal. So as you transport that into the UK, it would be interesting, I don't do this, but it would be interesting to look into it. If each church took somebody and either adopted or fostered or whatever it might be, that would certainly lessen the load for social care. And these are guys where um, special needs. These are guys with learning difficulties. These are guys from problem backgrounds as well. And yet that even, as I say, even one church, never mind everybody in one church. Um, that is a massive thing. And again, that is good news for that person. He's not stuck in a home. He's not stuck in whatever it might be. But he's getting a, hopefully getting a loving, caring upbringing. So he is. So again, that's another way um, that we can do that as well. I 
as I said, I studied, um, I studied uh, this subject um, and I managed to pass that and it was great. But God has got a real sense of humour. Um, so he has, because he says to me, right, okay, you've got the knowledge, you've got the theory, you better go and do something about it. In actual fact, it's no good just having head knowledge. We need to put that into practice. So, um, cut a long, long story short, um, I started working with a lad from the church. Um, and we started working away, cutting grass, um, painting fences, things like that. Um, <clears throat> and I actually learned more for him than he learned for me, if I'd be honest. But that was me just sharing the good news with that young lad because I was helping him um, have a better life. I was assisting him in his life and then I went on to work uh, one day a week with his brother as well. And again, it was as if God says, right, okay, I've, give you the, I've given you the head knowledge. You better go and do something about it now. Um, and I just, now I just work two days a week um, with these guys. Um, but it's sharing the good news. Um, I'm not preaching at them. Um, because they, they wouldn't understand me. Um, but it's taking them out. Um, we've got a shed project. Um, it's taking them down to the shed, helping them to make things, just trying to give them a better quality of life. And I do believe that's really what sharing the gospel with somebody with learning difficulties actually is. Sharing the good news. It's good news for that person. If I can help him or I can assist him in living a better life, um, it's good news for that boy or that person if I can actually assist him in living independent from his parents or whoever. That is amazing news for him because it's given him freedom, it's given him his independence as well. And I think really when we speak about um, how to share the good news with those with learning difficulties, that's what we're speaking about. It's just drawing alongside that person and helping or assisting them to have a better life. So it is. Um, is it difficult? Yes, it can be. Um, is it worthwhile? Definitely. Um, so it is. And so often, we may have, in church, we may have been conditioned um, to think about sharing good news as creating converts. How many converts did we get this week? Oh, I got five. Oh, that's amazing. So as, and I'm not saying anything against that. Don't misunderstand me. Um, because there is nothing I like more than sharing Jesus with folk and seeing folk get saved. But I wonder if we went to church and said, how many people did you help this week? How many guys were learning difficulties did you help this week? Oh, none. So you didn't share good news with that person? We might share the good news. We might tell stories about how many converts there were or how many people joined the church or how many people came to church. But how often do we hear actually sharing good news um, with people who have got learning difficulties? And I think that's just as important. Now we're nearly finished, you'll be glad to hear. Um, but what about the practical? What about your own church? Um, just you might want to do this as an exercise when we get back to a building and um, when we get back to meeting physically. If you can get a wheelchair or a blindfold or earplugs or all three, 
because in actual fact, some people are really restricted with their sight. They're restricted with their mobility and they're actually restricted with their hearing as well. If you can get one, that's good. But if you can get three, that would be even better. And go to church and just see how you manage. See what kind of experience that actually is for you. Um, it, it, is, it can be a nightmare. It really can be a total nightmare. Um, um, where am I? Lost my notes. You see, this is what happens. Yeah. Even accessibility. How accessible is your church to somebody who have, has got learning difficulties? Um, basically, even to get into the church. But hey, they might get into the church, but what if they need changed? Is there an adult changing facility? I don't mean a baby changing facility. I mean an adult changing facility. Is there that in your church? Sadly, well, no, no, but a few years ago, a couple of years ago, and this does break my heart, but sadly, one of the lads that um, I help, um, he sometimes needs changed. You go into a disability, disabled toilet, you either need to change them standing up or lie them on the concrete floor because there's no bed. There might be a changing mark for a child, but there's no one for an adult. If there's one for an adult, is that not good news? I wouldn't like to lie on a disabled toilet floor that's probably never been cleaned for a few hours to get changed and it's cold and freezing. And again, how accessible is our church for that? Is there that facility? Um, so that's just accessibility. Um, what are the, is there space? I mean, it's, it's absolutely mental because what we do is we create a disabled space within the pews or within the chairs. And we say, okay, guys, that's a disabled area. You better go and sit down there. If I go into the church or you go into the church, you can sit anywhere. You don't get told to go and sit in a certain area. Again, these folks should have the freedom to be able to put their wheelchair wherever they want to sit. Nobody told this is your area, this is your wee area. Again, what about accessibility of the church? Is it accessible in that sense? Have they got the freedom to sit wherever they want? Um, <clears throat> And again, I go back to um, icons or iconography, um, whatever way you want to look at it. Um, I'll get my, my illustration here. If I can do this, I don't know if I can do it. Can everybody see that? Maybe no. Mm -hmm. What's what, what, what's on my phone? What are the things on my phone? Icons. Right? Icons, pictures. Right? Mm. No problem to me uh, if I want to go into YouTube. Oh, there's a YouTube symbol. I can just press that and go into YouTube. And yet when we go into church, Sometimes, not so much new right enough, but it used to be the case that you got a hymn book and a Bible, but I can't read. I'm just. Um, again, if we have got somebody there who signs what the preacher's saying or what, they were, what the group's singing, 
Um, that is a massive thing for somebody. One of the most powerful times in our church, um, and Sharon was involved in this actually, was when we went back after the first long lockdown to physically meet. You couldn't sing. Um, you weren't allowed to sing out. Um, so what we did was, and it just happened a couple of times, we put um, Cornerstone up on the screen and played Cornerstone. Um, and somebody who could sign, they signed to Sharon. Sharon was standing up front. They signed to Sharon to the words of Cornerstone. And Sharon then signed to the rest of the congregation. And if they could, they signed. And it was one of the most powerful times of worship we have ever had. And I can assure you, we were singing our hearts out. And there wasn't a, a noise coming for a mouth, but just singing that song was really, really powerful. So again, have we got somebody up front who signs for the church? Again, and I speak quite a bit. Um, but do I use PowerPoints? And again, I don't mean PowerPoints with loads of words up on it. But what about symbols? What about pictures? So that somebody who has got learning difficulties um, and there, there, there's a whole um, Makaton signs, etc., that you could actually use. But supposing it's just a picture like um, the lost sheep you're telling, if you're telling that story, pick up, put up on the screen a sheep that's lost and they'll get it. They'll get it. So it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of time to organize that. But is it worth it? Of course it is because we're sharing the good news um, with those who can't understand it otherwise. Um, As I said, um, one of the best things is actually sign language as well. And it actually is a beautiful thing if you watch somebody who's singing through sign language. It's absolutely beautiful. So it is. Um, so really that's me came, I could speak for a lot longer, but that's me done okay, I think. Um, but if you've got any questions or anything to ask, feel free to, to ask away and I'll try and answer your questions. Um, a question I've got is, so I can, so how would you go about maybe reaching out to the families, can like, if a big part of us is, like, obviously it's great to go and try and preach to, well, reach out to the people with disabilities, but obviously the families, we would like to get alongside families as well, so how would you take a step, like, make a step to reach out to the families as well? There are, there are different ways, I think, to do that. Mm -hmm. but actually, simply by showing love and care and compassion and going that extra mile. I mean, it speaks about that in the Bible, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, if you go that extra mile, then what the families will see is, hold on a minute, that guy works with that company, but actually there's something different about him. Because he's doing this, he's doing that, he's doing the next thing, when actually, you shouldn't be doing that, you know? A big thing that I'm not so good at, and possibly because I'm awfully busy, but one of the things that I'm not so good at is I will work with these guys, um, but I, do I take them out to the pictures just for an act out? You know? Um, mm -hmm. Do I take them along to church yeah. services? Um, mm -hmm if we're allowed to do that, 
Um, and another thing, the Footprints Group, um, they took over the Hail Service one Sunday. Um, they did the Hail Service. They were signing and singing and reading and stuff like that. Um, now, the parents of these guys came to watch them. So again, you're getting a connection through there. Mm -hmm. And again, it was a brilliant service. I mean, they were amazing. Um, just to mm -hmm. touch on something else, actually, before anybody else asks a question, but um, during lockdown, obviously, we couldn't meet the Footprints group that I spoke about. Um, they couldn't meet um, because a lot of them were in, uh, had to self-isolate. Self -isolate. So we said, what can we do to try and still meet up together? Um, so we do a Zoom meeting every Thursday. Um, the carers um, or the parents log on and we have a Zoom meeting for a couple of hours. So we do have a, um, a treasure hunt. So we give them something to find for that week five or six things to find for that week. So we'll go away and find it and bring it back the next time on to Zoom. Um, we play bingo on Zoom. So we do. Um, and you might think, oh, Christian shouldn't have been doing bingo. But actually, it's helping in the, their numeracy skills. So as <laughs> you know, they're constantly looking at numbers. It's helping their numeracy skills as well. It's good fun. There's no money involved or anything like that, but we're just having a game, and it's something you can do on Zoom. We do our exercises as well, have an exercise time in Zoom, um, and it's still keeping contact, although they're in isolation. Um, it's still keeping that contact up. So, it is. Um, so that's a great thing, um, and hence why we have the subtitles. Um, because if somebody's hard to hear and they can read that as we're doing the Zoom meetings. Any other thoughts or questions? Or With the footprints, how do they come to you? Do you invite them or do they approach you to join the club? We did put a, an invite out um, and they would... Uh, they, I mean, we don't, well, we've not got the facilities, but we don't go and pick them up. They need to get make their own way there. But they hear through different churches. Um, they heard through the, the media as well. Um, and word of mouth, you know. Um, sometimes what you find is, like, one carer doesn't just work with one person. They may work in different areas as well, so they can tell others. Um, and to be honest with you, there is so little things happen socially for guys with learning difficulties that they're no longer in finding out <laughs> if there's a new thing starts. I can assure you that. I mean, again, it started... The footprints, I think, started only with... Was it three or four, Shane? Yeah, it just started with three or four guys. Um, because one of the one of the ladies in the church, she had two boys with learning difficulties, and there was a gap um, in all the projects for them to go to. So she decided and, and worked with Willie, and they really felt that they should come up with something for these guys. So it's actually a project um, that runs every week. So before lockdown, and then obviously after this next lockdown. They go for the day and they make their own snacks, they bake for their snacks, they make their own lunches. You know, it's a really good um, project and it's actually accredited now by the council. You know, they will they will recommend it. The transitions officers will recommend it to people. And so they have a waiting list um, for guys to come. And it's, it's so it's absolutely brilliant. And then from there, obviously, the connection with the church is there very much from the beginning. And it's under the umbrella as well. I don't know if you guys have heard of the prospects. Um, movement as well. Prospects is, it was started in the Church of Scotland and it's really an umbrella for all sorts of groups 
of guys with learning difficulties and they provide resources. They do a whole lot of work um, with all the groups. And then every year they have an annual conference um, and Willie and I have been privileged to go down and to, to, to speak and to share with the guys at the conference. And um, so we meet down in Tully Allen and Stirling, take over the whole police college and it's packed with guys with learning difficulties. We have worship times, teaching times for them. A lot is taught through drama, all these kind of things. So it comes under that umbrella as well. So there, there's loads out there that churches can access, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and we're really, I mean, Willie and I, as he said, are really privileged um, to be involved with so many guys with learning difficulties, you know. And so, somebody asked the question about how, how they come to church. Well, through the group, sometimes, you know, they'll enjoy it so much. Um, you know, we'll tell them that we do things on a Sunday as well. And, you know, they'll come along. So their families will maybe come and drop them off. And then perhaps the families will come in and then the families will start to come. And that's how you build up those bridges too. So, yeah. But again, I mean, you're again, Sharon was saying there that there is very little for them to do. But actually, church is something that they can do, something they can come to. Um, even if it's just socially, they can still come as well. Um, so there are different, different <coughs> excuse me, different things like that. And if you ever want to see how to worship, go to that prospect con prospects conference and you will see worship like you have never seen before. I can assure you, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, so as in Tully Allen. Any other questions or thoughts? Um, no. It's like anything else, well, like you didn't think of things like this because you hadn't got a disability yourself. Yeah. Um, I suppose we're all selfish and a lot we're, we're born selfish. And the way you're speaking, it's the way we should be dealing with things. I mean, it's 2021 and we're still not treating people that have only kind of disability with the, the credit that they're due, actually. Um, mm -hmm be it a physical, mental, or learning disability, we just do not treat people the way we should treat them. No. And in my own case, I suppose a lot of it's to do with ignorance. Yeah. But a lot that you've spoken about tonight, I would never even thought about. So I'm um, i pleased you've highlighted that you've highlighted. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. so true. I Thank agree. you. I... There was a lad who's a minister that I know I'm really friendly with. I mean, he was in a church down south somewhere. Um, I can't remember where it was, but as he went in the door, there was a lad there um, who was at the door just handing out the, the hymn books and uh, giving folk a welcome, so he did, and he had Down syndrome, um, and the, my mate really was taken aback with the welcome. I mean, the amazing welcome he got for this lad. I can't remember his name, but this lad. So he was so chuffed, and he walked into the church. And as he was walking into the church, he was still thinking about the welcome. He goes, no, no, hold on a minute. So he turned and went back to the front door and says to the guy, you know what? Thanks for that welcome, because it's the best welcome I have ever had going into a church. And he genuinely meant it because it was, um, so it was. So, I mean, again, um, one of the lads, I've watched it personally, um, mainly because I'm up front, but when he comes into the room, he lights up that room on a Sunday morning, I can assure you. Mm -hmm. um, he comes in and speaks to everybody and, hiya, hiya, how are you doing, hiya. And you just see folks face change. Um, they can, as you would say in Scotland, they can be as dour as get out when they come in. But when he comes in, it fairly lightens up their face. Um, so he's doing it for us as we would do it for him as well. Yeah. Anything else? No. 
So is he like um the the footprints um group that you've got? Is that held in your church, or is that? Oh, it's actually held. Our, our church is in Port Gordon, which is about maybe a couple of miles from Bucky. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. um, Bucky's a bigger place, so we have it. And actually, the mate that I was telling you about um, Riverside, uh, we have it in his church, um, mm -hmm. just because it's because it's central. Yeah. So, uh huh. Mm -hmm. So, is see if you were to have um, if you were to have like a a group during the week um would you in in a building what kind of things would you need to um make sure was accessible for every need like would it just be like your door access like you said your door access toilets. your toilets um would it just be like that kind of things or would you have to look at other areas it depends really what you're doing um yeah. But you would need to, if I mean, we, the guys make lunch mm -hmm. um, when they're there. Mm -hmm. um, they help make their lunch, the bake and stuff. Yeah. So obviously you get catering equipment, baking equipment that yeah. is friendly in that sense and not too sharp, etc. Mm -hmm. But they would always need to come with a carer. They yeah. wouldn't come themselves. I mean, we have oh, got, okay. I don't know how many folk work at it. There'll be three or four, maybe, um, mm -hmm. who would lead it. But everybody that comes normally comes with a carer. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a drop in. Yeah. Yours is like a drop in kind of so center. So footprints would be like a drop in. For years to use. aye, like a service use kind of thing, That's so they could come idea. and use set up, yeah. the same, set up the same idea. Yep. Yeah, yeah. They wouldn't come themselves because I like you're not for them. I mean, it's come back to what I was saying. It's good news. It's it's helping them. Um, you wouldn't just send somebody along, and they wouldn't be able to do anything. You know. Yeah. So mm -hmm. really, you would need people there. Or you need to specify that they need to come with a, 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 a parent or mm -hmm. a carer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is just it's it helps it helps the folk that's running it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because let's say you had sixteen folk come along with learning difficulties, mm -hmm. then you would need sixteen plus folk there to help. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that just mm -hmm. gets crazy. Whereas yeah. if they've got, if they've already got carers, um, then they can come along, and that takes care of that. You see, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. so it does. Mm -hmm. I suppose the carer will know what their particular weak spots or yeah. particular area of need is. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So do you work alongside the council or, or social services? Are they involved at all? Or are you totally independent of them? I think, no, we're independent of them, yeah. It's connected with the church. Right. Although it's recognised by the council now, um, okay. but we are certainly, it's independent of that. Yeah. And I mean, another thing, and I've not really touched on this, but... Special needs, isn't it just, there is a huge spectrum of special needs. Um, I remember watching a program on the television, it was a, a lad with autism, I think, and he loved drawing, so he did. So what they did with him was they flew him over in a helicopter, they flew him over the centre of London, twice, just twice, and gave him a massive um, canvas on a wall and said, could you draw what you saw in the center of London? And he drew it. So they got an architect in and it was exactly to scale. Couldn't believe it. So you've got that side that we've no spoke about tonight. You know, um, 
whether that's in drawing, whether it's in maths, whether it's in whatever it might be, but that can be in the special needs spectrum as well. Um, so there's quite a, it's quite a, quite a varied thing. So, as, mm. so we also have the, um, in the church, we're privileged that some of the guys just come along to the church and um, I do a lot of the work with the kids in the church and we have a young lad who is now high school age who is high functioning autism and he um, loves to come and help me and he's absolutely fantastic with the kids but what has happened is that his confidence has improved so much that everything has improved for him. School has improved for him. You know, the things he does has improved for him. He's now got a girlfriend. He's now, you know, he's really, really maturing and coming on. And a lot of that, his mum would say, is because he was encouraged to come and help and to come and be part of something that he believed in and something that a place where he felt safe and a place where he enjoyed coming. So there's lots of ways that, as Willie's saying, you can engage young people and then engage them as adults, either within the church service or in roles in the church. You know, and if they get a, if somebody with special needs gets a role in the church, they will do that role to their very best of their ability, yeah. whether it's welcome, whether it's the, you know, helping with the kids, whatever mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. um, say that guy is very high functioning in autism. So he's in mainstream school, but he's still very autistic. And yet he yeah. will explain to people about Jesus and, and you know, would question his family members. So do you believe in Jesus? No, why not then? You know, and <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, it's wonderful really. And, and if you really get into working with the guys with special needs, it really is amazing what happens. It's amazing who comes to church because of them. It's amazing who comes as a result of them. And they lead the way forward in loads of things. It's just being able to provide that place and that um, facility and that understanding for them you know and if you do that you know your your church will never be the same and god blesses that god loves these guys unconditionally and he blesses that and we've been truly blessed by you know all the guys that have we've been touched with with that, that happen to have a learning disability you know um so we would both encourage you to you know to get involved in some way you know to, to get involved whether it's in your own church or whether it's in part of your community you know there may well be a group you could you know encourage them and, and and get involved because they'll bless you more than you'd ever dream really and i mean as sharon was saying about that lad with autism um has confidence etc has just went through the roof that's good news for that boy you know we're speaking about how do we share the good news that's good news for that lad, you know. Amen. Um, so yeah, it's looking at things maybe a wee bit different as well. Um, and I suppose church becomes a safe place for them then as well. Yeah, it must be. Yeah, it's got yeah. to be. Yeah. Yeah, but they can trust. They, 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 they can feel that safe environment. I mean, I, I could be here. Oh, night, but there was another lad. We ran a youth cafe for a year, um, and there was a lad, and you knew, guaranteed, if you saw him coming in the door, you knew there was going to be trouble that night. Um, and nine times out of ten, that actually happened. Except one night, I remember it as clear as day. I was standing in the middle of the coffee bar um, just watching what was happening. And he came in and he came right around and stood in front of me. as just a wee lad. And he looked up, looked, looked up at me and he said, Willie, how are you doing? I says, I'm doing fine. What about yourself? He says, I'm doing really good. He says, I would just like to tell you um, that seeing this place, there is an awful lot of love. Now, he was never shown love. I know his background. He's never shown love. But one of the things that he recognised in that coffee bar, it was a Christian coffee bar, but in that coffee bar was the fact that people were showing love to him and others. 
and I can assure you, he was a terror. <laughs> it really was. I could have clapped him across the love Manette. But that's what he recognised. And people warm to that, so they do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anything else? I've maybe went on a wee bit too much, so I'm sorry for that. But... No, 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 no. It, it just goes to show you um, how I, like Pat was saying, how we really are just so selfish, are we? Like, there was a lot of what you were saying the night that I was like, oh my goodness. Like, I, you, and I even thought about it. You can, like, putting on the the um, the um earplugs and blindfolds and going into church mm -hmm. and sitting there. I probably would take off my blindfold within, within minutes because I would be scared far am I, fit my day in, loud noises and went into Ken Fitzarunma. Mm -hmm. So... That's for, I, I recognised it with, well, if somebody covered my eyes and I didn't care if it was going on, but I heard a lot of noise, I would be really scared. Yeah. I would want to take it off. That's what I thought of when you were speaking about it. And you just take it for granted that they, they feel the same as what we feel. But the, the, you can, it's, it's just such an eye-opener when you were speaking. Um, mm. and and also, it was also the, a lot of things that we probably take for granted ourselves, is like the the use of toilets and and things like that. It, it, we just ex we expect to be there, and it, it's something you just didn't think about yeah, really. And in. for somebody with special needs and, and things like that, it's it's a big thing to them. Ken, I work with people with special needs, and it's still it's like I forget when I leave my work. Ken, if you give it you forget. You didn't think. Ken, just a couple. Of, you would expect. If you went to a church, you'd mm -hmm. expect for there to be a toilet facility for yeah. you for that church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Surely these guys, if they go to church, should be yeah. expected now. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And even when you said about them, um, like when they come into church, nobody tells us where to sit. <laughs> it's like, I, it's just little things like that. You think how selfish. It, you actually have to get somebody to tell you like yourself, you're telling us this. That is how selfish we are. Would I even think about it? You can. We don't even. Another, think. another, th another great thing. Just, I mean, sharing. I, I, this isn't. I can't take the credit for this. It was sharing it with us. But the night when you go to hear your supper, if you can get a yogurt and feed each other the yogurt, get a spoon. Right, and you close your eyes and get the other person to feed you and see how degrading it can be, actually, to be quite honest with you. It's a fascinating mm -hmm. insight into it. So, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. I've did that in training before. I, I can exactly where you're coming from. It's so, I, you really horrible. take, you notice that you take for granted. You just see me brushing teeth as well, like, yeah. When you were doing stuff like that, it was just unbelievable, like how much you detect things for granted. So yeah, definitely. And you were speaking about noise there. You need to take off the blindfold because of the noise. You mm -hmm. multiply that noise by ten. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes that's what the noise is like with yeah, some yeah. autism or whatever. Mm -hmm. you know? I know you. You just uh, you're just trying to imagine it in your own mind that you would do, but. We really have no, no idea. idea. You can we we've got no idea. Um, fit it must be like for somebody to go into an environment, especially for the first time. Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember hearing somebody, and with us, we need to finish. But I remember hearing. I think it was a minister actually, and he started. He went to a new church, um, and it was at the leaders' meeting of the new church, um. And he says to the leaders, what I want you to do on Friday or Saturday or whenever it was, he says, I want you to go to the local betting shop, the local bookies, and put on a bet. And they're looking at him and saying, I can't do that. I say, but why can't they do that? Like, so I wouldn't have what to do. So I wouldn't have how to put on a bet or anything like that. He says, right, 
He says, and you're expecting folk to come into our church that doesn't care what to do. Mm -hmm. True. Same principle. Mm -hmm. Exact same principle. So it is. Mm -hmm. And again, if you multiply that, it can be worse for somebody with uh, somebody with learning difficulties. Mm -hmm. And I go back to that verse, for God so loved the world that he gave us a name certain people you know mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah so uh, well, thank you very much hey boy we'll maybe close with a word of prayer mm -hmm. and we can call it a day okay doc nice Thanks. seeing you pat ah nice to see you Danella. i know i haven't saw you for years i used to work for pat oh cool, cool. that was like well, my I, first my first i can't well, you just yeah. reminded me I'm for, I was for Peterhead Methodist Church. Ah, like, right, okay, yeah. I think to Zion, you know, like, but oh, I, met, I met you there a few times. Aye, I've been up there a few times right now. True, uh, <laughs> it's good. So it was up a good hearing you the night. You had a, you're, you're as good as ever you are. Oh, well, that's <laughs> too bad then. <laughs> yeah. Let's just come, uh, come before God in a word of prayer. Let's go. Okay, thank you. Father, we just thank you for this time that we've shared together. And again, Lord, we pray that we would be able to take some of this and put it into practice. But Father, we just would ask a blessing on everyone who has come into this meeting. Lord, we just pray that you would watch over them and richly bless them as they go their separate ways. And so, Father, we thank you for the group that's been set up as well and the witness that that's going to be. So, Lord, we just bless that. And, Father, we just ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Okay, guys, thank you very much. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you for your time. See you thank today. You. Bye. Right. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.